Hello again. Uh, now in the second lecture, I'm going to talk about uh, reporting landslide events, loss estimation, and risk reduction. Uh, the, we'll split the, the presentation, I'll split the presentation in these uh, four parts. Uh, first, basic data to be collected in the field then methodology and format for, for presentation of field data, then an approach for loss estimation and example from the field. And finally, I'll talk about the decision support system in the form of a toolbox for risk mitigation. Uh, the basic data to be collected in the field, it's uh, for landslide is basically, basically connected to what's the purpose of, uh, of uh, of the data collection or the database that we are collecting. In this case, uh, I'm assuming that uh, our our main interest is to characterize the landslide itself. So to characterize the event itself uh, and a characterization that can be eventually used for uh, for um, in an inventory for further calibration of uh, physically based methods or statistical methods. So for example, if we need to collect additional information about consequences that would require uh, other type of basic data. So the most important thing to collect it's uh, uh, first we need to have information the date and time of occurrence. Uh, uh, and before I continue talking about the other um, items, uh, it's important that we keep in mind that uh, some data, no matter how uh, how reliable it is, it's uh, preferably to have in none. So whenever we have the possibility to collect some data about the landslide, yeah, we should do it. And if we have a higher degree of uncertainty about that information we are we are collecting, then we just have to uh, to write a remark about on that. So it's perfectly okay to collect data on date and time of occurrence, uh, and if we have uncertainties of several days on the exact date, then that's perfectly fine to collect. It's preferable to have that than having nothing. Uh, then we need to characterize the landslide into the three zones. Uh, we character the, the land, characterize the landslide in the release area. It's an area where we have mostly mass removal and erosion that predominate, so that the uppermost part of the landslide. Then the transport area, where we have some erosion and some mass deposit. Uh, and finally, the deposition area in the lower part. In the lowest part, where uh, we have a predominance of uh, mass deposition, then it's important to collect data about the location of the landslide, either in the form of coordinates of a point, or uh, now that we have uh, other tools like uh, like uh, drone surveying, for example, it's important to uh, have a complete uh, a survey that that covers all the landslide area, including both the release, the transport, and the deposition area. And then, using information or or images from a drone, then we can reconstruct uh, a DEM, and we can uh, ortho uh, we can make an ortho correction of that and a georeferencing, and then we have the coordinates for uh, all the uh, footprint of the landslide. Then we need also to characterize uh, for each one of the different zones, the type of landslide, both the material and mechanism. Keep in mind that a landslide that may start as a soil slide at the release area can then develop into a debris flow, for example, at the deposition area. So the type of landslide can be different for each one of these zones. And that's important. Why? Because uh, our mitigation measures have to be connected, uh, dependent, uh, or have to be uh, uh, 
have to be associated to a type of landslide and then also to a type of measure. If it's a measure to avoid initiation, then it has to be a measure at the release area. If it's a measure to protect exposed elements, then it's mostly a measure that has to be implemented in the deposition area. Then also the dimensions of the landslide area, volume and depth should be collected as much as possible. And the maximum runout and other runout uh, uh, var variables that we could measure in the field. Then uh, we go to the topic on, to the part on methodology and format for presentation of field data. Then uh, in this case, I'm going to present a form that has three levels of detail. It's quite user-friendly with figures and boxes. And uh, it was developed uh, this year as part of a master's thesis by uh, Simon Antinsen, a student at the University of Oslo who now is finished with his master uh, degree. And he was supervised by uh, Anna Solheim and, and, and me. This uh, field collection form, uh, it uh, basically starts but by characterizing the landslide in general. So we have a first page where we give uh, information about who's the persons doing the survey, the date <coughs> of the survey, when the survey was carried out, uh, institution of the person collecting the data, email, name of the location where the landslide occurred, county or municipality, coordinates, date of event, uh, type of transport zone, if it was a channelized or an open slope landslide, slope angle, slope aspect, and the elevation difference between release area and the positional area. And then in the figure, we are shown the different parts or the different uh, uh, variables that are asked in the, in the form. And the total runout length, which is the distance horizontal distance between the the uppermost part of the scarp and the farthest uh, runout length. Then in the second page we give some information about the landslide material, uh, giving uh, information about the 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 percentage of uh, of uh, of rock, soil, and other particles. Uh, also we give information on the vegetation. Uh, and also some information about the, the morphology or the shape of the slope. We have a divergent, straight, or convergent. And finally, information whether we have an exposed bedrock at the different uh, areas, release, transport, or the position area. <clears throat> We did he give here information of, about some preliminary dimension of, of the release area, uh, preliminary dimension of the deposition area, uh, most probable tri triggering factor, and some comments about the triggering factor. And important is to be able to prepare some sketches in the field based on the observation. <coughs> then, uh, we come to do a characterization for each one of the different areas. Uh, we start here from the from the uppermost part to the lower part. So first, there is a characterization of the release area, the largest slope angle, the then the length, width, depth, and the volume. The dimensions are uh, illustrated here in this figure. Uh, <coughs> the shape of the release area the type of soil cover, the strike and dip orientation of the bedrock if observed, uh, some type of indicators of the pore pressure condition because that can be an important factor in the release or in the triggering. Some comments about local pore pressure, pore water pressure conditions and some comments about the release area. Then we come to a transport zone. Uh, 
if there is some type of branching of the landslide, we have to mention that here, number of different branches or paths. Uh, and then the type of material that is found uh, uh, along the transport zone. And that can be identified easily either at the bed of the transport zone or on the sides. And uh, we can also characterize different segments along the transport zone in terms of the length, elevation, different width, depth. Uh, if there are levees like this one, we have to indicate the height and also the slope angle. This information can be very useful eventually for back analyzing or back calculating velocities along the transport zone. And calculation of velocities is useful in turn for uh, performing back analysis and calculating the, 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 the run out uh, or the rheological parameters. Yeah, then these are uh, the parameters for velocity uh, measure in a band. Uh, we come to that in a moment. And some comment related to the transport zone. And finally, there is a characterization of the depositional area. We have to describe uh, the surfaces over which the material is flowing, uh, the length, max depth, maximum depth, average depth, maximum width, average width, area, volume, and slope angle at the start of the depositional area. <clears throat> One has to be a bit careful with the uh, calculation of average and maximum depth because uh, uh, in general, uh, the depositional material, uh, when it has a lot of water, there is a process of consolidation and dewatering. So the final thickness that one sees uh, after a few hours of a landslide uh, may not be the actual maximum thickness or width that it had. So one has to exercise some care on that. So that's why uh, uh, mud marks on trees, for example, can be quite useful uh, in addition to looking at the depth of the deposit because mud marks on trees uh, are basically showing uh, the actual maximum depth that occurred during a landslide. And one has to be careful uh, to look at uh, uh, maximum depth on uh, measure, at the measurement, that the measurement of nuts, maximum depth on trees has to be taken not on the side of the tree that was facing the landslide, but on the side of the tree uh, opposite to the landslide, <clears throat> because the side of the tree facing the landslide uh, it will be higher this the depth of the flow will be higher there because of the velocities uh, a rough grain size distribution should also be given and the type of grading that one observes whether it's a normal grading reverse or not then in the deposition, uh, we have to mention something about the stopping mechanism. Uh, some coming comments about the stopping mechanism, uh, indications of multiple searches, and some comments about the depositional area. Uh, some appendices can be provided, pictures, maps, soil samples, profiles, GPS measurements, geophysical data, hydrological measurements, and other. Then the field, this field uh, guide has also some, um, this field uh, form has also some guide at the end uh, that you can also read. Uh, we can provide you with the PDF uh, via our, our colleagues from ADPC and NGI. <clears throat> And this uh, uh, field guide, it's uh, basically as, a, is a, as an aid to complete the, the field form. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the scheme that is showing us how to back analyze uh, velocities in the transport zone based on the 
on the on the geometry of lateral deposits in uh, bands. Okay, so these dimensions we just have to enter into this equation in order to calculate the velocities. And the same way you can also uh, look at the run-up height in uh, obstacles along the flow, and the and that run-up height can also be used to back analyze velocities. So this is a, a field form that we have developed uh, recently. We, as I said, with supervision from another colleague of NGI and from NG and me. But of course, it's a form that we have taken as input a comment from many colleagues at NGI, and we expect the form to improve over time as we use it. <clears throat> the next topic in the presentation is the <clears throat> to talk about an approach of, for loss estimation an example from the field. Uh, then the main uh, purpose here is to be able to obtain vulnerability curves that are used later in a risk assessment. So we have to think about the process intensity. If it's a uh, debris flow, then the, the deposit height is important. Then we have to look at the elements at risk, whether it's buildings, uh, agricultural land, infrastructure like uh, roads, railways. We have to look at the different types of damage patterns, uh, flooding in cellars, ground floors, debris deposition on ground floors, and so on. And we have to look at the cost for per repair of the work, per, for the repair works and the uh, monetary damages, the value of the object themselves, and using this information we can figure out the degree of loss, and we also need uh, to have information of not the monetary damage from past records. So basically we need to have some type of inventories. And this information can allow us to calibrate vulnerability curves. This is an example uh, uh, from uh, from northern Italy, uh, where there are different unit values for different building sections per square meter. Uh, for example, different building sections have different monetary value. Uh, then also we have a table showing the price of repair works following a flood event. And this is the example or the area where of this example I'm showing now in uh, Northern Italy. Okay, this is uh, examples of buildings that have, were exposed to different uh, flood depth uh, between 1.2 meters up to three meters and the degree of losses vary from 24% to 100% total loss. <clears throat> this is for an event that occurred on August 1987. So here we have the plot of uh, the, the degree of loss versus the intensity for all these uh, buildings, and then also a uh, fit of the vulnerability curve using different uh, regression forms. Generally, uh, well, these uh, vulnerability curves are going to have an S, are going to be defined by an S function, where the both at the beginning and at the end of the vulnerability curve, we tend to have more or less a horizontal tangents. <clears throat> Uh, this is um, uh, like the best curve that is obtained from the calibration and validation of the data. And here is the comparison of the curves, of different types of curves uh, obtained by different authors. So they are really not so different one from the other. Uh, this is a form that uh, can be used uh, to uh, to collect uh, damage data from the field, 
uh, in a systematic way. Uh, it's a forum that is contained in the same uh, paper uh, where we have this presentation on the uh, on the vulnerability assessment in Northern Italy. Uh, I want to mention that uh, uh, when uh, we we had an exercise uh, uh, just before the summer during a workshop in uh, in Sri Lanka, where <clears throat> uh, several pictures of or images of uh, damage from uh, due to landslide to several buildings in in Sri Lanka were presented to participants from ADPC and NBRO. And uh, based on the input from the participants in the workshop, uh, it was possible to estimate a vulnerability curve. And interesting enough, the vulnerability curve was more or less falling uh, above all these curves. So this is quite important to note because uh, that is giving us an indication that in general, the vulnerability conditions uh, for the buildings in these uh, areas affected by landslide in Sri Lanka, uh, have uh, the structures have much less resistance compared to the average structures that were used for the calibration of these curves. So these curves, in general, we can calibrate for average conditions or we can calibrate for different type of buildings. And then uh, that allows us for, of course, to perform a, a more accurate estimation of uh, damage. Some concluding remarks on loss estimation. <clears throat> the basis for loss estimation has to be an inventory of landslide consequences, which should include the hazard intensity and degree of damage. So anytime we're collecting data on uh, degree of damage, it's important to uh, have some information on the hazard intensity, the landslide depth. This framework can serve as a basis for adapting similar methodology in other contexts. For example, as we have done in this uh, ongoing project in Sri Lanka. <clears throat> it's important to mention that uh, we are interested here on collecting data, not only in buildings that suffer damage, but also in the buildings that did not suffer damage. So I just want to show here that uh, part of the inventory that we collected, it's also a building that had very little or no damage. And that's also important to collect because uh, these events, I mean, buildings that uh, ha have not had any damage are also important for the calibration of the curve. I mean, we, we don't need to, we should not concentrate only on this part of the curve. We need also to have information about uh, buildings that have had little damage. <clears throat> uh, these are the references for uh, for this part, so uh, so you can refer to this for more information on uh, these uh, methods for loss estimation. Finally, I'm going to uh, present a, a work that is ongoing at NGI for, it's a work on, de on the development of a toolbox for selection of risk mitigation measures. Uh, and this is done as a system for decision support. The work is done as part of a larger project called Climate 2050. Uh, this is a center for research-based innovation and the main purpose of the project is to achieve a risk reduction uh, associated with climate change adaptation. It's an eight-year project running in this period with uh, a total of 20 partners, nine from the industry and private sector, six from, from the public sector, and five from the research and education. NGI is one of their research partners. The financing for this project comes from the Norwegian Research Council and the partners of the project. NGI in particular is the leading partner for our, the work package on landslide hazards. And the tool that here I'm describing is a product uh, now in beta version of Climate 2050.
Okay, so uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, uh, then uh, these are the partners that uh, uh, we have in this Clima 2050 project. Um, there is NGI, uh, part of the partners the public sector include the, the, the road authorities and the railway authorities. Uh, <clears throat> and also the airport authority airport authorities and the main uh, 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 agency in the government that owns the public buildings. And from the research part, we have uh, uh, two universities, the main engineering university in Norway, the, the School of Business and Administration in Norway, uh, the a research institute connected to the uh, main universities in Norway, the Meteorological Institute and NGI. And then several, uh, both engineering companies and uh, also uh, uh, providers of um, materials of construction and so on in the private sector side. Then the tool I'm going to talk about, it's uh, basically answering to the question in how to choose the best safety measure against landslide. Against landslide. And this tool is called Larimit. Uh, this is the, the, the website to access the tool is shown there at the bottom. So the tool is operational, but remember it's in a beta version. So uh, you have to take any, you, you should take any results you get from this with caution and uh, only as preliminary. Uh, the web, the tool can be also run from a mobile phone. And again, this is the, the link to access. The motivation to this web portal is uh, that uh, uh, operational risk mitigation involves the identification and implementation of suitable risk mitigation measures, actions, and of policies to reduce risk to acceptable total levels. And then risk management is quite relevant to stakeholders and decision makers. But stakeholders want to know which options are available, how expensive and effective they are, how can alternative mitigation prevention options can be ranked and communicated, what processes are necessary to gain consensus in a community and move towards effective action. And also researchers need to focus on how to convert better scientific information about landslides into actual policies and practices that will prevent and mitigate risk. So the purpose of the portal is to allow extensive databases of alternatives for mitigation measures to provide an expert assistance tool for the case and site specific ranking and best practice selection of landslide risk mitigation measures to allow the synergy between portal administrators, not knowledgeable but non expert users, and landslide risk experts in pursuing the optimization of risk reduction measures. The operational flowchart is as shown here. The experts on one side. Uh, the who define uh, the database of measures, the relevance of, and weight, then the administrators who basically rank the list of risk mitigation measures using a ranking algorithm, and this tool, uh, which is given by the toolbox to suggest site-specific best landslide risk measure, risk mitigation measures. <coughs> And the site and the user, of course, who provides the characterization of the landslide site condition and different weights for the different uh, aspects for the selection or the different criteria for the selection. Quantification of risk from the geoscientist point of view is uh, the same that we have mentioned before, hazard times consequences. And to reduce risk, one should reduce the hazard and or reduce the vulnerability or exposure of the elements at risk. 
The structural measures called currently in the database are these ones listed here. Uh, some of them are aimed at reducing hazard, so they are mostly uh, connected to uh, slope stabilization, and other measures are aimed at uh, reducing consequence. So they are mostly uh, aimed at the protection of elements. So these measures more or less assume that you have already a landslide that has been triggered. Uh, this is an example of, uh, of the one type of measure that is available. Uh, this is uh, for soil nailing. If you access the tool and you create a user, you can also access to this and read about uh, the different uh, uh, the, uh, detailed description of the measure. <laughs> And also read about uh, uh, the diff for which materials the measure is more suitable, and uh, the rating for different type of uh, selection criteria. Uh, in the decision making flowchart, uh, there there is on one hand a technical ranking that depends on technical suitability criteria, does not account for site specific impact criteria and it does not account either for case-specific rapidity of implementation. And then there is a consequence-based ranking uh, depending solely on site-specific impact and case-specific urgency of implementation criteria, and does not account for technical suitability criteria. Uh, here is an example case study uh, done in uh, the valley of Gunbrandstown in Norway, which experienced a lot of debris. <coughs> in the last 10,000 years, which has built up a lot of colluvial, plant, colluvial plants. So here we have input uh, the characterization for the case. We input uh, the different uh, technical characteristics of the landslide. Then uh, uh, based on this, we have a technical ranking on the different type of uh, measures that are proposed and the scoring for each measure. And finally, based on the constraint that the user defines, so the user defines this constraint in decision making uh, based on technology, performance, design, implementation, safety in construction, durability, aesthetic impact, and economic impact. So based on this, uh, there is basically a, a ranking of the different of the of three mitigation measures that have previously been pre-selected: uh, the deflection structure, the debris-resisting barrier, and the drop structure. And then these uh, three uh, options are compared based on the different selection criteria. And then when we put the weight on the reliability and durability, for example. Uh, we have reliability here, and we have uh, durability. Then we see that the deflection structure is uh, the winner or the most optimal uh, uh, mitigation measure. Yeah, here we see it. A summary and conclusion about the toolbox. Uh, this study. Uh, tries to introduce uh, the web-based toolbox for landslide mitigation measures. The tool can provide more knowledge about alternative for mitigation measures to stakeholders, decision makers, and the public. Also, it provides preliminary strategy of the risk mitigation, and it involves not only technical the suggestions from the toolbox, they involve not only technical suitability, but also social and economic constraints. And uh, it's important that experts acting alone cannot cannot choose the most appropriate uh, method. A better way is to do it in a multidisciplinary approach that should be considering for the development of the toolbox. And these are some four developments that we consider for the toolbox, a compilation of a wiki of a compendium of uh, best practice, links to literature, risk estimation tools, tools for mitigation cost estimation, database of regulation case studies, integration with geospatial databases, and statistical management of expert inputs. So uh, I encourage you to uh, try to test the tool yourself, uh, either here in this, um, in this work, in this meeting, 
or later on. So this is the this is the link to it. If you experience any problems by registering or or running the tool, let me know. Uh, we have quite uh, we have there's quite a good maintenance of the tool so far, so we are uh, fixing problems uh, as they come. And uh, yeah, but let us know so your your input. Uh, from uh, uh, on using the tool is very important to us. Uh, so this is what I have to say for this second part, uh, second and last part of my participation in this uh, in this uh, meeting. Uh, I appreciate very much again your 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 attention. Uh, please do not hesitate to contact me for any questions you may have. And also, I encourage you to uh, to bring up uh, uh, doubts or, or comments with my colleagues who are present, who have, who have the are lucky enough to be present there with you. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, and again, thank you to ADPC for inviting me to participate in, in this uh, important event. And I wish you the best of luck in the continuation uh, of this uh, regional meeting. Thank you.